Hey guys, this is Gray Thompson, and this is the Not Snowboarding Podcast. When you get to the mountain and you're feeling a little risky, and you want to get close and uncomfortable and out of control, and ride outside of your ability limits, <laughs> then you go hot boy for the day. <laughs> that That's actually a funny story how hot boy came about. Eric and I were riding Alpine one day, and it was super crowded, and we were just, you know... We were hot boying before we knew we were hot boying. <laughs> and we come flying down the trail, down to the lift line, and it's just jam-packed. And I think Eric like came to a hockey stop and just sprayed some, some elderly skier gentleman. And he just turns around. He's, you guys are out of control. You guys are just hot boying around. Welcome to episode number 25 of the Not Snowboarding Podcast. I'm your host, Nate Musan. What is the Not Snowboarding Podcast? Well, it's the show that each week my buddy AJ and I chat with someone in the snowboarding industry about their passions outside of snowboarding. Somehow, though, snowboarding always seems to come up to you. Before we jump into the conversation that we had uh, with Gray today, a quick thank you to all of the folks that have clicked through to Amazon via the Amazon Batter ad located at the notsnowboardingpodcast.com. It kicks the podcast a small commission for the items that you buy on Amazon, and it doesn't cost you anything. Thanks again. Let's jump into the conversation that AJ and I had with Gray. You've been pretty busy. How huh? You were this weekend, you went to the rally for Rocker. Yep, went uh, up to Donner Summit for the rally, and uh, then the last day of Boreal. Yesterday, I saw you out there. Yeah, I saw you too. How was how was your weekend then? My weekend was um, like a, a mini vacation where I didn't have to leave my home. <laughs> <laughs> so many activities over two days. Yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah, tell me a little bit more about the Rally for Rocker because that's like, a, it was like a charity event. Yeah, so it's an event put on sort of as a memorial for a buddy. I never knew him personally, but he was a big figure in the community rocker they called him um he passed away snowboarding up on donner summit a few years ago and um some of his friends local guys started this um event up the rally for rocker slalom um they throw it this was the second year i think okay i missed out last year but i made it this year and all the local guys build a sweet slalom course um, up in Donner Summit in the back country and invite the whole community out. And it's also a um, little benefit to raise funds for the new skate park in town. So they want to build a new skate park in Truckee? Yeah, they want to expand on it, I think. I'm a little out of the loop on all that. Okay. <laughs> but, um, it's for a few different good causes and... Uh, to me, it's more just an awesome, awesome end of the season thing for our community where everyone can come out and take a few last runs with each other and kind of end the winter on a bang. So there's not many snowboarding events around the area that brings everyone together like that does. You've kind of had your finger on the pulse of all, all what I would call like the fun events, all the, the bank slaloms <laughs> and all the... The, the Thompsons ret, Retro World Championships and really anything that is, to me, just like you look at it from a distance, I haven't participated in any of those, like, that looks like fun. That's what I want to do. Where, where do you think some of your um, your inspiration and desire to do those events comes from? Uh, well, yeah, I agree with you. I've been, I've been leaning towards these fun events the past few years for sure. Um, uh, growing up, no, no, know, dis no disrespect to the rest of snowboarding. It's all fun too. <laughs> no, no, none at all. Um, yeah, growing up, I, I uh, competed a lot in slope style and half pipe and border cross and all those, you know, circuits that cruise around the Rev Tours, the USASAs, and all that. Um, and I don't know. I was riding with a this little like team up here in in Lake Tahoe, so we'd all ride together and travel and do these contests. And I was always 
going to them. I was more on the back seat. I would compete in, you know, whichever ones I, I could, but it, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Um, as far as the competitive aspect of it went, um, just felt it was when it came down to competing, it was super serious and, you know, gave me butterflies and made me nervous. And those weren't the feelings that I had when I would snowboard any other day. So I decided to kind of venture away from that path. And, uh, and as I did that, all these more fun vibed, you know, get out and hang with your, with your buds type events started popping up everywhere. And, and it was a, a new, new take on, on it. That was a lot of fun. It's, it's interesting for me at those events, and maybe it's a little bit different since the one I just went to a couple of weeks ago was a, a half pipe, little mini pipe event over at Seven Springs. There was technically a contest, but since it was open jam format and just a, a couple hours like wide open, and, and I'm going to say that the majority of the kids that ride that mountain don't ride a lot of half pipe, but they put a lot of focus on the event and pulled a lot of really good riders that would normally be like more like your park rider um, yeah. into the half pipe that that non-pressure environment where it's not like uh, Gray Thompson dropping now, everybody's going to judge him. It's just more like, Gray, get it, man. Yeah, get it. Okay, you don't normally ride the pipe. Like you just learned a, a 360 in the pipe. Now you're learning fives on the same day. And it's just, it's like that that fun environment of, what it's like when you're out riding with your friends without, without the pressure of, of being judged. Yeah. Um, no, it's awesome. I mean, if you look back at, you know, the early days of competitive snowboarding, when they first started hand digging half pipes, um, they were like, you know, world competitions yet they were a jam. Like all the guys knew each other and they'd come out, you know, to ride together from all over the world. And, and it was more of a, Hey, let's all hike this pipe and try new stuff and just have a blast. And so what if we're getting judged? Like, yeah, there's people that are going to take it serious, but I think the snowboarding really gets amplified when, when, uh, you know, the judges and the people throwing it are looking at it more as a session or a jam rather than all right, now you're up, so drop, do your run, then we're going to move to the next guy. Um, I, you know, snowboarders, they they feed off each other, and when you get to, when you get them all together and just say, go wild for three hours, no one's stopping you, you can do anything you want. Um, the energy is just crazy, and and it's it's a lot of fun. The vibe is is great. It seems like a more um, natural way and like authentic way to snowboard. Yeah. Like because if you, I I don't know if I've ever ridden in a slope style or a half pipe contest. Yeah. But I've had friends do it, right. and it's like they get one or two runs a day. Yeah. You know, but I've ridden in a lot of rail jams and a lot of jam style events. Yeah. And I mean, if you're hiking a lot or there's been like a handle toe or something, it's like yeah. you get a ton of runs. It just oh, seems yeah. like how I'm normally snowboarding. Yeah. You know. Exactly. So I, I can see, like, not only is it more fun, but it's just more natural mm -hmm. to be a part of that. Yeah, it's weird, you know. You know, say you're on the slope style circuit and you go go to Breckenridge, you get one day of practice, and you know maybe it's only open for a couple hours. Get to hit the jumps as many times as you can, figure it out. Then the next day, maybe you get ten minutes of practice, and then all of a sudden you got to go drop and do one run, maybe two, hope, hope you land it. You know, it, the course is still foreign to you. Um, so that's, yeah, that's not natural. That's not what you do when you go snowboard on any normal day. Yeah. Um, I think the, the trend towards jam sessions is the best thing in competitive snowboarding right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I even see that since, um, of of style of or of motive like I see that in like your the videos that you're part of or like mm -hmm. the like with Warp Wave or yeah. 
um, anything. It just seems like um, you guys, it's less of like, sometimes I feel like things are production where they'll set up right. and work on parts of it. Right. You know, like they're shooting a movie yeah. or whatever. But you guys, it seems like you guys all like are riding together. You're capturing how you would just be every day, yeah. you know, and it's not a break away from like almost trying to pose yeah. to do something. <laughs> And it's like it's really sick to watch. Like I get excited, yeah. and then even watching you guys yesterday, uh, closing day, it was like this is like a live. This is exactly yeah. what it is. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, shoot, growing up in Tahoe here, we've always had the sickest crew of riders. You know, yeah. And every time we go snowboarding, there's at least five of us, mostly more than that usually, and we're always just amping and feeding off each other and, you know, ripping around, getting close and crazy and jumping over each other, slashing each other. And I mean, to us here, it's snowboarding's a, it's a group activity, you know, it, <laughs> you could be having an okay day and then go rip around with five of your best friends and it turns into one of the best days of the year. So you know, when, when Eric and I started Warp Live, that was kind of one of the main parts we wanted to focus on was how do we show that vibe of how we ride every day into a snowboard production, you know, that's so, that's been so part-based and such, such a production, like you're saying, yeah. in the past. And, uh, that connection with your friends when you're riding is, is so interesting. And it really takes me back to the crew that I used to ride with, um, my friends Shade and Andy and Davis, that we just, we would like sneak out of school together to go ride. We would go on every little trip together on the weekends. And these yeah. guys, when I was riding with them, I could ride within like a millimeter of them. I knew what their move was because I rode with them so much that I was never concerned about colliding. And that's really what you guys translate with the uh, the warp wave stuff. It's not just like, oh, there's Gray's part. No, it's like Gray and Eric. Like you guys work together as as a unit in those videos. Yeah, that's funny you say that because me and Eric talk about that all the time. Just how it's funny when we go ride squad together. You know, on in an afternoon we'll go out and we just take turns following each other as close as we can you know, off side hits, off cat tracks, carving around. And we've really, like, learned each other's snowboarding. And we can anticipate our next move. And and uh, it's, a, it's really cool. It's this weird little connection that you get. You can, look, you can look at something on the mountain and go, well, that's not for me, but that is definitely for him. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's where he would turn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Every feature is for a different person. With all of these like slalom pump tracks, have you been involved in the actual like building and shaping of it? Or are you kind of like me when there's a mini ramp going up in the neighborhood, show up a little bit on the first day and then show up like when it's done? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> usually, let's see. This year I built, me and my buddy Felix built our first slalom, uh, the first one I've ever built from start to finish is that uh, the is that the secret mountain one that the video just came out on? slalom yeah out in the woods uh so we built that one and then i've helped out building on the dirksen derby a couple times um didn't have time to help on the rally for rocker unfortunately but those guys knew what they were doing and did it right but uh i don't know i think it's it's really cool to to build it from scratch and and really look at the look at your slope before there's any berms and get a sense for the flow of it and you know where to turn where to put a berm where to put a jump and it, it's a it's a fun process it makes you get creative and and think about things differently than just showing up and shredding so and I ask that because every time it snows near me, I have a, a hill that I have these huge aspirations and there's a couple of driveway jumps in it. I'm going to put these gaps and berms and like rhythm jumps and I'll, I've gotten as far as like 
two or three features and that's mm-hmm. that's like four hours <laughs> it takes a while maybe the snow's not so good maybe i need some salt or something but uh, at a certain point i'm like cutting my losses like this is this is more work than i signed up for yeah well that's where your friends come in and uh bring some muscle to the table <laughs> that stuff takes a while when you're doing it by hand for sure. I mean, you could always rent out some people, Nate. Just make a post on Craigslist. Yeah, there you and, go. And, <laughs> like, you pay them a little bit. I mean, people are hurting right now. The economy isn't doing so well. Like, <laughs> come out and move some snow around. Yeah. Just, like, kick them a few beers. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Another day off. <laughs> Too funny. So, <laughs> kind of shifting gears here a little bit. Uh, you've been making, like, some modifications to your snowboards over the years and kind of designing boards. Um how did that uh, parlay into the conversation with uh, Steven and Pete and, and the uh, the Space Cadet board at United Shapes? Man, that's a juicy one. <laughs> <laughs> so about three or four, probably, f- no, what was it, four, four years ago, I just started, you know, there were a couple of people, like Scott Blum, I remember seeing a board that he just took a jigsaw to and started cutting the tips and tails of it, you know, making it, making it weird, making it something of his creation. And, um, and that was cool. And then I started writing this board from K2, the happy hour, and it had these really exaggerated pointed tips on it. And I thought it was super interesting to look down at your board and, see something other than your typical you know round nose round tail twin tip and kind of spice things up you know look down at your feet and get get amped that you're on something different and weird and uh so i started messing around and looking at you know all these weird tail designs that people shape on surfboards and and looking at old winter sticks with swallowtails and and really thinking about, you know, the shape of a board and how it translates into writing differently or even just how, how it makes you feel when you're writing it, you know? Um, so I did, did a bunch of weird cuts to some boards and, you know, always was thinking about, you know, how different shapes would ride and what, what I would do differently if I were going to design a board and, you know, to, to ride how I like to ride. And, and it just kind of started building up in my mind and had all these ideas going and didn't really have a huge outlet to make anything happen. Um, what do you, what do you mean by not having a huge outlet, like resources, like boards to cut on or. Well, I just, I got to the point where I, I'd, uh, you know, cut as many tail shapes as you can cut into a normal board to where I was like, okay, I want to actually design a board that's going to ride differently all all the way from the nose to the tail. You know, I want to mm-hmm. think about side cuts and, you know, width of the board and float and taper and all this stuff. And, and I was riding for a big brand at the time where you know I'm when you're a young guy writing for a big brand like you don't have too much say in the company or what what products they're going to start making so I guess that's where I didn't quite have the outlet to to make some of my thoughts happen so is that so that's what pushed you like, that's a pretty you know good reason to do your own board company <laughs> yeah so you know? yeah so uh, basically Then it got, well, this was last year. So last year, um, Steven and Peter at Owner Operator, they gave me a shout in the spring and they said, hey, we have a few people that want to do a collab board with us, but we don't want to just throw a graphic on some board that, you know, they already make. Like we have our ideas of our own we want to design boards. Why don't we just design our own boards? Yeah. You know, they've done a couple in the past with some of their buddies, but, uh, they're the same way. They got a million ideas and know what they want, know what they don't want. 
So we all came together and decided right then and there, let's just go out on a whim and start a board company. You know, we have all these ideas. Let's create our own outlet for them and see what we can come up with. Who That's, did, I mean, they definitely stand out. Like, I think I, the first, I think I saw Felix riding mm-hmm. that board first. And I was like, and then my friend Tucker. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was like, it definitely stood out to me. The shape, just the graphics, like the color yeah. of the board. It just seemed like, seemed different, seemed interesting. And yeah. I'm like, okay, what is this all about? What's the you know, <laughs> and now now I see more and more with the secret mountain song video. And, yeah. And it and I I really like the aesthetic of everything. Yeah, you know, and it it's almost like because there's only one board out, right? One size, one model. Yeah, this yeah. year, this year has been our soft launch. You okay. Can say so. Um, we developed the Space Cadet, and we're just kind of taking this year to slowly get the name out there. You know, get people to start seeing it around, and and uh, there's more on the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I do like I do kind of like the limited nature of it, and a little yeah. bit. It's almost like a boutique yeah. snowboard company, and I, there's skate companies that I like a lot that are like that. Yeah, and and even with owner operator, because that was a new company to me, mm-hmm. and right. I like, I like they make really good stuff. It doesn't seem they make like a ton of it. Yeah, it's like sort of like I was like checking out the day, and there's like all these sales in the season. Yeah. Like these are the last pair of these pants right now. You know, yeah. And, like, that's kind of cool to me. Yeah. That it's made in the USA, right? Yeah. So it's made in the US. Is it somewhat limited or is it limited in some way? Yeah, I mean yeah. the quantities are are super low. I mean we're not all about just making something rad and then pumping out tons of it and just oversaturating and pumping it down yeah. everyone's throat. Like there's something cool about keeping things small and keeping it tight and and you know only making what you need and yeah and no excess um so i mean and the brands are still so small that i mean we're not really in the position we can crank out huge numbers of things but yeah i it's it's kind of a bummer to walk into a shop in the spring and see things from two or three years ago that they just have excess quantities of. They're trying to get rid of that seventy percent off. You know, <laughs> like that's not a good look. <laughs> well, then it's I don't know. I think there's something special. Like yeah. when you find a company you're hyped on, like someone finding United Shapes and like, oh, there's only one of these. They only yeah. make one model. There's only one, and like you riding it at your mountain. It's I think it it gives you the sense of like. Like you, like I'm more hyped on because I found it yeah. and I know about it and it's, it's, I'm more like closer related than like yeah. some big brand that they make a ton of the shit that everyone uses. Yeah. And I think the more I skate and more I snowboard, the deeper I get into it, I'm looking for that it's kind for of certain stuff. things. Yeah. Yeah. And that's been, that's been a huge topic and, and uh, idea behind the brand is we want we want to like this cool relationship between consumer and the brand where they, they understand our vibe, you know, they mesh well with it and they really want that product. Yeah. Like they want to be part of this bigger brand and, and it's, I don't know. It's to me, it's, it makes, it's more natural. It makes way more sense. It's, you know, I feel like I could call up anyone who buys a board from us and, and say, hey, let's go ride, and we would just totally <laughs> be on the same page and and be stoked. So, yeah, I, I that'd be incredible. That's yeah. beautiful. If I bought a board from some company and someone involved with it, or it was like, oh, oh you're yeah. in the area, like let's go ride together, I would be blown away by that. Yeah. I mean, there's not a lot of companies that would even think to do that, let alone yeah. make that happen. Yeah, because. All these huge brands in snowboarding just alienate the consumer from snowboarding in reality. Like, it's just too big and too unobtainable to people where the truth is we're all just boarders, you know? Yeah. And we can all ride together and feed off each other. And it's all, it's all for the better of stokage, you know? We're all <laughs> just trying to be stoked. 
So it's it's I'm really stoked on being a small brand in that in that sense of really like working with the consumer and for making them feel like they're a part of it. Yeah. So that's that's what I always wished people were doing, you know, growing yeah. up. I just have to say two things about the Space Cadet is one, I stumbled across it uh, a few months ago when I was on Oper- Owner Operator's website. There was a link uh, to it, and it was part of that soft launch, I think, that you mentioned before. It, was, they weren't, it wasn't even like hyping it on the website. It was just like, oh, here's a board. And mm-hmm. I, I'm looking at it, and it gave me that feeling that you were telling me, that you were saying, like when you look down at your board and you just get psyched. Like, yeah. look at this thing under my feet. Like, I'm, I'm just stoked on it. I, I want to go ride it. I want to go make turns on this thing. It gave, just looking at it on the internet gave me that feeling, the combination of the graphic, which I don't know why, maybe it, it just is different enough from everything that's out there right now, really resonated with me. And then yeah. the shape, you know, and then the shape can maybe called back to uh, some of the boards that I, I rode growing up and in some aspects, but I know that it, just looking at it, it's going to ride better than those boards. My my only concern is that I, I I like a little more of a mid wide board, so I'm wondering, is there is there a mid wide coming down uh, the pipe here soon? Yeah, so we are going to be releasing a few more shapes this fall, and the idea is each shape only comes in one size, so. Mm. It's not like we have this the space cadet and you can get it in a fifty three, a fifty six, or a fifty nine. Yeah. Um, so the you know it's it's a brand of all these different shapes that are united under this this brand, United Shapes. And <laughs> so, yes, next year we'll be releasing a a fifty nine. That'll be it'll be a mid wide. Um, you know, so people with bigger feet or someone smaller that wants, you know, a deep pow board. Um, yeah. And, and every year, you know, we're going to, we're going to be messing around with shapes and offering different things for different people. Um, you know, if, if I could, if I had every resource at my fingertips, I would be making sure we'd had a product for everyone you know, right off the bat. But in reality, we got to, we got to take it step by step and and slowly get there. So I hope our, any uh, loyal fans we have out there with big feet, don't put us, put us on the back burner for too long. (laughs) Hope we don't disappoint for too long. Well, part of what makes it unique is that um, you are doing it that way. And like you mentioned before, it's not one brand that's going to be for everyone it's the brand for someone that you could call up and go ride with right right yeah i mean it's it's a brand in my eyes it's a brand for snowboarders who who love the mountain and just love the feeling of snowboarding you know they're not you, they're not necessarily the type of person that wants to go and train and learn every little move and, and take it to the com- competitive side or anything like that. But it's, it's a brand for the person who, you know, wakes up at five in the morning on a pow day and is the only thing on their mind is shoving coffee down their throat and getting to that lift line, you know, so they can go get some fresh tracks, you know, so. Or is, for the person who's motivated to to get on the board as or, much as possible. Or he's already passed out like in his truck at the at the parking lot at the bottom. Yeah, like, exactly. Right. They camped out in the lot. Yes. <laughs> Do you think you've um, developed more into that style of writing over time as you've gotten older? Because I kind of look back at like some of the Be Happy stuff you used yeah. to do with like I mean, Colton and, mm-hmm. and Max and, and Sammy and all those dudes. And it, it seemed more like more park riding, yeah. more of that kind of stuff. I mean, definitely had that more surf style. Like, do you have like a surf background? Is that? Um, a little bit. I mean, yeah. I was never like, I would never call myself a crazy surfer, but I grew up in San Francisco and yeah. three hours from the mountains. So after school, 
I would go hit the beach and surf every day. So surfing's been in my life since I was 11 or so. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but that's funny. Like when, so when I started riding with the Be Happy guys, um, that was kind of right after I was transitioning out of the, out of that little contest phase okay. we, we were talking about. And, and I was really stoked because I found these kids who were filming, you know, they were out making videos and I'd never done that before and I'd always loved film and and that side of snowboarding but that was like my first opportunity to to work on a video project and get behind a camera in front of a camera and it you know we we all were into different things you know a lot of those guys were super into jibbing and park riding and you know, I was always trying to get into the back country and get those guys out there. And um, those were some awesome times. And the, that was definitely the start of it all. And mm. definitely the beginning of, I like to call like really figuring out my, my personal style and how I like to ride, what I like to ride was, was back in those days. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, when you're 15 and all your friends are riding the park, you're going to be there too. Sure. <laughs> yeah. But now it seems more like, um, definitely more like, I don't know, organic Yeah. style like we've talked about before, yeah. but like more just, riding what's in front of you. Exactly. Just, you know? It's just riding the mountain. I mean, yeah. if, if you took the park away and you just looked at the mountain, you would visualize a park you know yeah like there's just so much terrain out there that it's there's a feeling you get when you find it on your own when you just venture off the trail and all of a sudden you found a sick wind lip that's perfect yeah. to do a backflip or a cool cliff drop you know it's just it's a different feeling you get when you can hit something that you have found versus you know yeah. some something man-made i don't know there's kind of a disconnect for me personally so when you're you're, you're yeah. doing you're doing all this work with um warp wave and you're also working on the snowboards and everything at united shapes and you snowboard you you strike me as like a a very um busy but yet balanced <laughs> person what what do you attribute i guess your your work at, ethic to oh what do i attribute my worth ec work ethic to Gosh, probably my parents, honestly. There's some hard working people, man. Um I just grew up seeing my parents balance all these different jobs and opportunities and and all you know, all this stuff, but I don't know, it somehow got in my DNA and and I'm i I'm the kind of person where I can't not do anything i always have to be doing a million things at once for some reason <laughs> and it's really tiring but it's it's funny like as soon as i kind of come to the end of a project i'm thinking oh man why did i bombard myself with so many things like thank god this is coming to an end i'm gonna slow down maybe just focus on one thing and then in reality that that time comes around and i just dive into something else um so I, I that's a good question. I'm still trying to figure that out for myself, I guess. <laughs> but was there something that your parents told you when you were a kid about work? Um or was it just watching them? I mean, take my mom for example. She's she is an entrepreneur. She you know, she runs her own business. She she was on the board of a nonprofit and she has a million friends she's always going out with. Uh, so I just grew up watching her like bounce from a crazy day at work, come home, make dinner, and then go out with friends and network and network and network. And she would always kind of keep me in the loop on what she had going on in her life. And whether it was business or whatever, she, you know, it was. 
she wouldn't just keep her work life on one side and then her family life on the other. Like it was all this kind of this big stew, like work is life and life is work and you got to learn to enjoy it all. So I think I, I definitely just kind of figured that out by seeing it, you know, um, and they, you know, they made me get a job when I was young and, and realize that I got to make my own living. <laughs> They're not going to support me my whole life. So that definitely um, added to it. What job did you get? My first job was construction um, for a family friend. I was 15 years old and got th- thrown into the mix pretty quick. It was crazy, but uh, definitely looking back on it, as an awesome opportunity to go into manual labor and really get a taste of the real world and how, how rough it is, um, (laughs) how work is actually work and it's back breaking. But when you get that paycheck, it's, it feels rewarding. Yeah. The other thing that's cool about construction and a lot of the trades is at the end of the day, you can look back and you can see what you did as opposed to a lot of jobs where you sit at a desk maybe and you're in a service industry and you're yeah. doing something very valuable, but it's it's gone. You don't look back and see the, the results of your work at the end of the day. And the other thing that I think is really cool about construction is that it's very applicable to daily life in, in the future. You know, if you want to create something, you want to make a snowboard. A lot of those construction skills translate over. Yeah. No, I agree 100%. I mean, I'm I'm a very visual person. You know, I like to work with my hands and, like you said, see something come to life and see progress and, and create, you know. And um, it's it was perfect for me. And the skills that you learn from it, from, you know, from simple things like learning how to use tools and, and uh, design things to how you interact with people on a project and, and, you know, group dynamics and stuff. It's, it's all like coming full circle now, you know, building snowboards. Um, I definitely feel like I went to school for it. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny. So I've been following you on Instagram for a while and I've seen a few um, fly fishing um, photos and fly tying photos. How long have you been tying flies uh, specifically? Um, a long time now. <laughs> is it because of the poor winters or is that just a summertime activity? No, I started tying flies when we actually had awesome winters. <laughs> and, and you would actually get trapped in your house for a few days. And so you had to tie flies to keep yourself sane. <laughs> um, Let's, well, I, I, I grew up fishing with my dad. He got me into it at a young age, and um, I just fell in love with fly fishing because there, it's so intricate. There's so many different parts to it. It's not just, you know, like Duncan Power Bait where you, you just sit on the shore and watch your bobber go under. Um, it's It's a lot like snowboarding or all these crazy activities where – you know, you're mobile, you're out adventuring and you got to read the water and understand the bugs and the ecosystem. And you could spend a lifetime fly fishing and learn something new every day. So yeah, you can't actively fly fish with the beer in your hand. (laughs) No, I guess you really can't. I mean, there's, it's always nice to enjoy one on the river, but you got to, you gotta wait till after you catch a fish. Uh, believe me, I've tried. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you could get creative and figure it out. Like one of those uh, hats with the straw. Yeah, a beer helmet. There you go. <laughs> or Camelback. Yeah, that would work too. <laughs> yeah. So you started fly fishing really young with your dad, but um, I'm really interested in tying. I, I don't fly fish anymore, but uh, yeah. I used to love fly fishing and I used to love tying flies uh, specifically. Yeah. Do you have other friends that do it? How did you learn? I mean, it's, and, and maybe even we'll back up a little bit and just say that tying a fly for a lot of people that may not know 
a lot of people's first impression of that is that you're trapping some live insect and tying it onto a hook. <laughs> That's very true, huh? Just wrapping a bug to a hook shank. Um, no, I think it goes back to the the whole construction bit, like, you know, seeing progress, seeing something come to life, creating something. Um, you know, when I really got into fishing, I, I wanted to do every part of it. And then I found out about fly tying and how you could make any bug you wanted. And, um, it was just so cool to me. And, and I, I, you know, I grew up doing art and stuff and it, it, trans it, it was just, you know, like another cool project to, that made you think about fishing more. I don't know. You could be at home, but still feel like you're on the river, you know, you're still connected to it. And so I, I tied for a while and when I was younger and then kind of stopped for a bit as I got more into snowboarding and whatnot. And then, um, past few years, I got right back into it again. I started fishing with a really good friend of mine and he lives down the street and, and he kind of like reignited my passion for fishing again. And, um, it's funny. We have every week we get together and we have knitting club, we call it, but <laughs> we just sit around a table and tie flies and gossip about the river. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going down at the river? Yeah. What is like, did you hear he caught that fish? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny, man. It's it's just like, you know, finding your, your friends to go snowboard with. You, It's cool to find a bunch of homies to hit the river with, and it's like a, a little escape from snowboarding, but it's pretty similar. Yeah. Do you have the same friends that fish and snowboard, or they're like, there's some crossover? There? There's, there's some crossover for sure. I mean, nowadays... Shit, every snowboard kid is a fly fisherman, but... Um, <laughs> I feel like all the kids from the Midwest are. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Like. Yeah, it's it's cool. I mean, it. you know, I, I've i been fishing the Truckee River for probably 12 years now, and when I first started, it was me and my dad, and the only people you'd see out there were 40, 50-year-old guys, you know, <laughs> with beer guts, but... uh Nowadays, I go out and there's like 20-year-old kids left and right. Um, it's pretty crazy. Um, but up here in Tahoe, there's a really solid community of fly fishermen and who have been here for ages and, you know, really, really are looking out for our local waters. And um, it's, it's a cool, like, little community outside of the snowboard niche here to, to kind of be involved with. You gonna be able to fish this summer? It seems like the water's been pretty low, and <laughs> yeah. California is struggling with water. Yeah, this drought's not not too good for fishing. The, the Truckee will probably be dried up in a couple of weeks, so gotta hit it tough right now. Wow. Yeah, it's sad, man. It's super sad. Last summer we stopped fishing in June because the water got too low and warm, and the fish were just not very stoked. Yeah, so. not enough oxygen and too much heat in yeah. the water. Exactly, and so you you know you gotta you know the the world works in 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 phases, and when the river's low and it's going through that phase, you gotta back off and and go skateboarding or something, and let those fish chill out. You know, don't put too much pressure on them. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's an activity for every part of life every phase so so i'm gonna ask you kind of a couple of uh quote like canned questions that we've asked on the show to several of the guests um mm -hmm. one's kind of funny and one's a little bit more serious we'll start with the serious one between and i don't even know if surfing applies since that was more of your childhood but between all of your passions we'll say surfing fly fishing snowboarding uh making mov movies um if you could only do one for the rest of your life, which would it be and why? Snowboarding. <laughs> I don't know. I Snowboarding found me when I was six years old. It's been the only constant thing in my life. And it's provided me with so many opportunities and happiness and all everything that 
I've, you know, I've dedicated my life to it and it is what I want to be doing when I'm 50 years old. So without a doubt, like everything else is awesome in itself, you know, it has its own reasons that it rules, but I don't know. I'm a snowboarder. I'm here to snowboard. <laughs> that's awesome. So rad. Yeah. That's like that. That stokes me out a lot because yeah. I really haven't surfed that much. Yeah. I think I tried it once and it was fun. Yeah. It was cool, but I don't know if I could fall in love with it the same way I fall yeah. in love with snowboarding. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it's rad to hear someone else say that. Right. You're, the, you're the first person, first guest we've had. That's crazy. That said that. I think. I don't know, man. It's, I think just, Kimmy kind of said that in a way, but not 100%. Okay. But you you were the first one to just be like, psh, psh, snowboarding, duh. Yeah, you're, you're pretty like, <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Of course, I mean, snowboarding. <laughs> I mean, it's easy to like say, when you've been snowboarding for so long, like some of other people you've interviewed, like, and had such a long career with it, like, it's definitely like easy to feel like you've done enough of it. And sure. maybe it's time to, try a new avenue out and live at the beach and surf like but i think deep down they all they all couldn't go on without snowboarding like. <laughs> no it's not a fair question yeah <laughs> I, i'm on a quest to find an area where i can snowboard skateboard and surf like all in the same day and just live in that area california man <laughs> <laughs> but with nobody else around yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so this question is going to be probably a little bit more funny and maybe a little awkward. Um, have you ever played uh, like Fuck, Mary Kill? Yeah, I think so. so it's like you throw out three <laughs> women. Like, fuck, Mary Kill or just Mary Kill? <laughs> I, I felt, I felt yeah. bad about saying kill for this one, so we'll just say delete since there's some like uh, – potential political and governmental ramifications when we're talking Un unfollow. about unfollow we'll say unfollow. yeah yeah unfollow so <laughs> you're pretty upset when you know there's programs that people know that when you unfollow them so oh, yeah. on social media <laughs> so pretty upset so right. but anyway you know won't be as upset as dying or hope right. hope not it so if you had to fuck marry or unfollow michelle obama hillary clinton or laura bush what would you do Oh God, I'm not. I'm like so out of the political loop. That's a tough one for me. <laughs> okay, Michelle Obama and Laura Bush and Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Jeez, <laughs> <laughs> you're asking like the least political guy standing on this earth. <laughs> um, we should change that to snowboarders, Nate. Well, I know those are all first ladies, so yeah. That, but, uh, gosh, um, I probably have to unfollow Laura Bush <laughs> right off the bat because she's gonna be bummed. She might text you. Yeah, I don't know about her choices in life, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> not to offend anyone. It's a personal viewpoint, but uh, um, probably would have to marry Michelle and take down Hillary because I probably couldn't. I probably couldn't li marry and live with Hillary forever. <laughs> <laughs> She's too. I don't know. I feel like we'd get into arguments. <laughs> <laughs> well, she could, she could, uh, she, she's running for president now. Oh, in really? In 2016, yeah. Ah. So she could, if she becomes president and you bang her in the White House, she could do what Bill did. That's true. And then, you know, payback's a bitch, payback's motherfucker. A bitch. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> she might be down. She might be like, oh, maybe, good opportunity. So you could be a part of a scandal. You could maybe write a book. that's why she's running for president. <laughs> so you get back at Bill. Yeah. She's been waiting. She's been waiting. Kill Bill. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Is that pretty in line with other everyone else's answers to that? That's Wait, a kind of a new question. Yeah, man. we haven't asked that one a ton. We haven't asked that a bunch. That, okay. That's inspired by um, my neighbor and sometimes podcast co-host Paul Horning. All right. He's like, you gotta, you gotta ask some some messed up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get the dirt. I got, I got, I got a question. All right, I got a would you rather. 
Ooh, and I've asked this before to some people, but I'll ask you. Okay. I don't know if you've heard this one. Okay. So would you rather watch your parents have sex every night for the rest of your life <laughs> or join in once to make it stop? Ah. Oh, my God. Where do you have time to think of these? <laughs> Jeez, Louise. That's a tough one. Well, Like, what level of join in do you have to do? <laughs> I, guess that's, I guess I haven't thought about it that much. Like, Man. I guess, you know, that's up to you how much you join in, but you have to join in. Well, maybe I could, like pick watch for the rest of my life but somehow like make it a peep show and like charge some money and, <laughs> and get some other people involved <laughs> Web, business webcam people. webcam <laughs> that entrepreneurship runs yeah. deep in your family I guess you gotta think creatively man it's <laughs> always an answer that's the best answer I've ever heard to that question. <laughs> Everyone's kind of boring. This I'll just join in. You gotta, <laughs> just, just to get it over with. Just take the, the easy way out. Just they, yeah. You're actually like want to make some money out of it. And yeah. Hey, that's business incredible. Is business. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about my money. <laughs> I've never heard that question, and I never want to hear it again. <laughs> just, I don't know. That was for Paul. We had to ask some fucked up stuff. Well, he he's gonna love it. <laughs> So as as we start to wind down here, I've I've got another um, uh, kind of new question too. Is uh, what websites do you go to daily? What websites do I go to daily? Vimeo, basically. Um, go to Vimeo and watch hundreds of movies all the time. Get inspiration outside of snowboarding, mostly. Um, what what types of movies? Um, I. Lots of short films and music videos and skateboarding, weird skateboard edits and um, what else? Lots of surf films. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm I really like narrative and and short films, and I like to see what you know low budget filmmakers are are creating. Um, so I'm always scanning through Vimeo. It's such a good outlet for people who like to make movies. Um, so I'm I'm there a lot, and then I go to What Youth a lot, the surf site. I don't know if you guys check that out. I have it. It's kind of surf and youth culture, and a little bit of skateboarding. Sick. Lots of lifestyle. It's, they got a they got a really good vibe going over there, and. They're super creative and always doing something like myself. So, so uh, I'm I'm always digging what they're what they're scheming up. Is it anything like Monster Children? Yeah, yeah it's pretty similar to Monster okay. Children. I'm down. But what's cool about them is they they create their own content. So, which is so awesome and just so not in snowboarding. Like, you know, every <laughs> snowboard website is just posting the same stuff, just yeah. reblogging and posting the same edits but those guys actually you know uh bring all their pieces together and and create a, you know cool content that they want to produce and and they they make it themselves so i think that's really really awesome and i'm trying to do that myself so i would yeah. say you are succeeding <laughs> well, thank you <laughs> through through sierra surfers is that uh, sort of the, or just through everything you do it seems like you do yeah, a lot of stuff I mean, just everything I I just I got the creative bug I just always want to be creating something so um, you know Sierra Surfer is just our little it's just a little like following it's a little just I don't even know what it is it's <laughs> where it's the community up here of people who are surfing the snow. Um, so, you know, we make some sweatshirts, we make some stickers, but it's more just a little collective of anyone up here who thinks they're surfing on snow in yeah. the Sierras. Yeah. Anybody trying to do some hot boy in? 
Yeah, and then there's Hot Point is the other outlet, you know, when you get to the mountain and you're feeling a little risky and you want to get close and uncomfortable and out of control and ride outside of your ability limits, <laughs> then you go Hot Boy for the day. <laughs> that That's actually a funny story how Hot Boy came about. Eric and I were riding Alpine one day and it was super crowded and we were just, you know, we were hot boying before we knew we were hot boying. <laughs> and we come flying down the trail, down to the lift line, and it's just jam-packed. And I think Eric like came to a hockey stop and just sprayed some, some elderly skier gentleman. And he just turns around. He's, you guys are out of control. You guys are just hot boying around these slopes. <laughs> <laughs> and, we just started cracking up. Thank you, sir. From that moment on, the hot boy and the hot boy and movement began. <laughs> Thanks to that elderly gentleman on the skis. I wonder if he knows if he started the movement. Oh man, I think we scared him off. He'd probably quit skiing. <laughs> All these hot boys out here. I just can't keep up. You can't keep up, man. It's too dangerous. That's too funny. <laughs> Where would you point people to find you on the internet? Uh, warpwave.com. Uh, check us out. It's Eric and I's production project. Kind of a conglomerate of a lot of things. Snowboarding and adventuring, camping. But that's kind of our website. We keep updated with all our latest videos and some blog posts and photos. Um, so that's where you can find me and my crew. What's the next big project? The next big project is going to Mount Shasta this weekend, and we're filming a short film for United Shapes for the official launch. Sick. So been been looking forward to this one for a long time and i can't wait to see that yeah it's, it's gonna be super rad just i'm um, grabbing felix and we're driving up there meeting up with the filmer buddy of mine sam tour and we're gonna go shoot some super 16 millimeter on a volcano oh. so, dude i'm down yeah that's so sick it's gonna be trippy oh yeah <laughs> so that sounds Thanks. awesome. Do you have any uh, any parting words? Um, parting words. Maybe maybe we'll frame it up in the the position of any words of advice for that teenage snowboarder that wants to do something in snowboarding but doesn't know where to start. Yes, if you're a teenage snowboarder you want to do something in snowboarding, start walking out of your house every day and um, <laughs> start walking out of your house every day and taking every opportunity that comes to you. Um, get your hands in anything and everything you can. Get into art, get into film, skateboard, surf, just be outside and be around creative people and just align yourself with with people who who you jive with who are on the same page as you and don't get caught up in the classic snowboard party scene that's so prevalent these days and just stay focused i mean if you work hard it, it'll pay off for sure that's great advice. Yeah. That is amazing advice. You got to go out and just do it. Yeah. That's you really you just, say. no one's going to, no one's going to give it to you. You got to create your own opportunities. And the only way to do that is to do it. So that's what's worked for me so far. And, and that's what I'm going to keep doing. <laughs> I can see that with like everything you're involved in and, and yeah. with the, you know, with United Shapes, it's like, a little bit more DIY, mm -hmm. you know, mentality, which I hate to say, I don't want to say like kids 
or lazy or whatever, but sometimes I see that in kids. They're like, they kind of just want it to happen. They just like, well, I'm a good snowboarder. So it's going to happen. So everyone, you know, and like they should just notice and they should just kind of hand it to me. And I don't, I just want it so bad. But they like, I'm like, well, if you really want something, why don't you just do it yourself? And then you'd be way more hyped on it. You don't have to. Exactly. You know. No, that's such a, that's, that's what's happening these days. It's crazy to me. Like, you know, it's just the direction society's going with technology and everything is kids aren't getting their hands dirty anymore. And, you know, everything they need's at their fingertips, you know, it's crazy, but it'll come around. People will come around. It's fun to, to make things happen yourself and you learn to appreciate it. So I think kids will pick up on that. Great. I just remembered. I, I wanted to tell you I was at uh, Super Park last week. Oh, and, nice. And the the Warp Wave hoodies were like not everywhere, but just enough to where yeah, it was like, oh shit, how, how can I get one of those? <laughs> no way. <laughs> it, you you were, you guys were well represented. Wow, that's awesome to hear, man. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for the positive Facebook messages and emails. Thank you for the iTunes reviews. And thank you for supporting the podcast by using the Amazon banner ad. Until next time, peace. Thank you for listening to the Not Snowboarding Podcast. To hear more episodes, go to www.notsnowboardingpodcast.com.